Glad to be here and to share with you this concept of um, the heroic leader and about leading what I call leading by two, something I've been working on for five or six years. And I want to begin by telling you um, two true tales that are the origin for my thinking about leading by two and becoming obsessed with it, frankly. And the first one, uh, they're both priest stories, coincidentally, uh, betraying my roots. So the first one was about this guy, uh, John McInnes. I was in my th uh, third, second year of law school, and I was madly in love and engaged to a woman uh, to be married. And uh, this guy took us through two great marriage prep sessions and asked us questions that were surprising to hear from a celibate priest. You know, like, uh, how do you deal with money? And how much do you want to save? And how much do you want to spend? And uh, how were you raised? How emotionally expressive was your family? And how did they deal with anger and disappointment? And um, all kinds of great questions being asked of two people who were, you know, kind of goofy in love, crazy in love, and not thinking anything would roll out that would be challenging or difficult in life. And he was helping us to sort of see that forward. Well, um, a little background. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and from a big Irish-Italian Catholic family. They'll all be together for Uncle Pete and Aunt Helen's 60th wedding celebration today in Detroit. Um, and um, so probably 50 or so people. And my wife, Jennifer, is from San Carlos across the bay. She was born in British Columbia, and her parents uh, emigrated, immigrated to the U.S., and so she was raised in San Carlos, and Father McInnes knew that we were going back to Michigan. People would say to Jennifer, you're from California, he's from Michigan, and you're going to Michigan? But we were indeed going to Michigan. You were there, go blue, all right, or maybe green and white. So, so we're going back to Michigan. And uh, a big part of the reason is that when I go back, I'm going straight into political life, and I intend to be governor of Michigan one day, and I have the dream, like many young people, of being president one day. And so in this third session with him, he looks across his desk at the two of us, and he says, Dan, what happens in uh, eight or 10 years if the party comes to Jennifer? And they say, here you are, you've got a law degree, you're so bright, you work well with people, and there's this state senate seat that's open, and this is probably a good time for a woman, too. He said, how would you feel? And uh, Jennifer kind of blurted out, <clears throat> that would never happen, that's, that's not going to happen. And I thought, oh my God, I am, worry I am marrying my worst competition. <laughs> I am marrying somebody I probably couldn't beat, and this could happen. And I told him, I think I'd be confused by the prospect and maybe a little frustrated. Uh, but if she felt called to that, I'd be 100% behind her. Um, well, he had it all wrong. He was off by about two years. And um, he had the wrong office. He, at the time, I remember him saying state legislature. And it ended up being attorney general in Michigan. We'd had an attorney general for 37 years. We called him the eternal general. Every four years, rumors were that he would quit, and he never quit. Uh, but this time he did. He quit. And people did indeed come to my wife, and she was elected Attorney General of Michigan, and four years later elected Governor of Michigan, four years later re-elected Governor of Michigan. And that completely flipped my life. Um, I'm grateful to the prescient priest who <laughs> prophetically saw that something might happen, and, and in fact did. And so I had to um, learn other things about leadership, uh, that I wasn't going to be the heroic leader. Um, and in some ways, she was and wasn't going to be the heroic leader. She was governor from 2002 to 2010. And if you remember that period, that's GM in bankruptcy, Chrysler in bankruptcy. It was, it was hell on earth. And she was doing everything she could to change it. But one person doesn't change around uh, a state economy in a global world. So that was the first story, um, thinking not about my being a heroic leader, which I dreamed of, but uh, something different, and playing really a servant leadership role, a whole other strain of scholarship around servant leadership, fascinating work around servant leadership. But here I was in a role raising my children and supporting my wife, et cetera. Um, so in 2011, when she was done, we came back here to her alma mater, 
um, but for a chance for me to really explore a lot of my career that had been kind of on hold, and she's been a fantastic partner for me. So there's this wonderful give and take over a period of time that happens um, that I was talking to this couple about last week, two really talented young people getting married, and you know, there's gonna be give and take and, and luck and all kinds of things, right? So I come here and I teach Shazi's, Shazia's class, and um, I think this woman, uh, the second priest, Brita priest, might have been in your class or right around then, and I said to this class at the end of the fall, I'm gonna teach a seminar in the spring, and it's leadership but you can do whatever you want. So you can take on a project, uh, or you can take on study, or you can take on both. And I'll bring some content, but you'll bring experience, and we'll have this really cool engaged encounter with each other about what leadership looks like and what we're passionate about and learning about. So she, at the beginning of the semester, Britta says, um, could we have coffee sometime? Because um, I'd like to talk about the class. And I said, sure. And so she said, um, my friends wanted me to run for president of my sorority. Uh, but I didn't want to be in the sorority box all year. So I'm vice president. But I want to do the job I want to do. So she said, how can I be the VP I want to be? How can I really lead? And I started to talk with her about uh, leadership and authority and how when you're in the number one slot, there's a lot of things you can't say. There's a lot of things you can't do. You have to be political in some ways. Um, but if you have a great partner, you can do all kinds of things you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And I started to give her an example of my wife and a chief of staff, and one chief of staff who was an extraordinarily talented man and led fantastically with her, and then another who was, you know, you know, good but not great. And so I encouraged her to do that. But what happened was she lit a fire for me, which happens to me all the time with students, is somebody comes up with an idea and you go, you go, wow, like I hadn't thought about that. That's so awesome, let's pursue that. So that got me going. And as you'll see, I could only see um, twos everywhere. That's like all I can see now. I have like this weird visual condition that all I can see are pairs. Um, so I wanna frame this talk, oh, look a frame, um, with three ways you might listen and then engage with me, because we will get to questions for sure, and I love the engagement. So um, the lenses are first, the great leader. So I'd invite you to think about twos in terms of high profile people and what that's like. And then second, I'd like you to think about you, think about your partnerships, and especially best ever collaboration. So I'll give you a second to think. Was it a manager you had at some point? or a coach where like you were in sync and you did great stuff together. Maybe it was a peer, maybe it was a co, maybe a co-founder, um, or uh, you were just thrown into something and they were in sales and you were in marketing and, and you know it just clicked and clicked and things went well. So think about your best ever partnership. And it may be on your personal side because obviously uh, this doesn't uh, stay on the business side, but it crosses over. So it may be an extraordinary relationship with a spouse or uh, some significant other. Everybody got something they'll have in mind? This would be yes, this would be not yet, no. <laughs> yeah, okay, you got somebody to, to keep in mind. Okay, great. So um, the outcome I hope for is that you'll leave like thinking about leading by two, feeling what it's like, seeing it in places and especially practicing it, seeing what you can do to lead by two and might that change your personal framework around what leadership is and how you might do it well. So that's kind of the outcome. So I wanna convert you, uh, like I kind of converted this guy, Kenny uh, Cromer. I used to give these bottles away. I won a cash award for teaching, and so I just bought a bunch of water bottles. I'd give them to students at the end of class. And I'd say, this thing, can you read it from where you're at? The bottle says, kill the leader. And i say, you just put this on your desk. Your boss thinks it's about hydration strategy, right, and keeping yourself healthy and drinking a lot of water, but you'll know it's about the idea of the leader is a stupid idea, and that you're as much the leader as your manager. You may have different ways of doing it, uh, and you may do it better than them, as many of us have. Anybody ever felt like they led better in their department than their manager did? Yeah, so a lot of us had that experience, right? So that's the goal, is when you're in Machu Picchu, you're having a 
kill the leader bottle. So here's the roadmap. I want to do four things. They're all P's because that's fun. So the first one is the prevalence of pairs. The second one is the power of pairs. The third is the practices of pairs. And then, because I couldn't come up with a word that meant this, I went Spanish on you. Uh, <laughs> preguntas, so we'll go with questions will be the fourth part. So that's kind of the layout. So let's start with um, prevalence. And just some fascinating examples first, and then um, just see where you see it happening. So um, I think that two is the atomic unit for leadership. And anytime you see a one, you can say, is it really one, or is there somebody else there? At least some other essential pair. Maybe multiple pairs, but at least some other essential pair. So for example, this is, this is audience participation time. Jobs and Wozniak, right? Um, without which each other, there is no Apple. I think we can say that. And arguably without Tim Cook as a successor, the same story. Okay, this one? Chicago Bulls, Michael Jackson and Phil, uh, Michael Jordan and Phil Jackson. Um, extraordinary partnership, of course, Venus and Serena. Like, now think about that just for a second. Imagine the competitive, honing each other's skills, right? Pushing each other, this sort of subtle competitiveness, or not so subtle probably sometimes, right? Also, the extraordinary encouragement that we've been privy to of how they've supported each other through you know, a pretty challenging kind of lifestyle they've had to lead. So some cool things are happening here. Um, anybody know these two? Xerox Corporation, who is it? Judy Woodruff. Uh, Woodruff, no, it's, um, uh, it's Ursula Burns and Ann Mulcahy. Mulcahy was CEO of Xerox, Burns was COO, quite a power duo. Very rare, by the way, on Fortune magazine that you'll see two people, almost never happens. There's one of Steve Jobs and half, half of Tim Cook. He's like, his face is halfway off the page. Because we don't see it, we have this myop, myopic, myopic view of ones everywhere. Okay, these two? Uh, Gates and Balmer, and before Balmer, anybody know? He died last year. Paul Allen, extraordinary, extraordinary mind. It. Fascinating memoir. If you're a memoir reader, pick up Idea Man, uh, uh, Paul Allen's book, because it's so interesting, and their partnership is so interesting, because Gates really, Gates really is not good to him in many ways. How about these two? This is Carol Christ, our chancellor, and Paul Olivasados, our provost. I went in when Carol Christ uh, was announced to be president before she was president. I said, hey, I'd love to work with you. I'm a leadership guy. I'm in my blue suit. She's seen all these you know, white men in blue suits who are great experts. And she kind of said, I've read books when I was president of Smith. Was she Smith? And she said, you know, I thought a lot of that was just garbage. And and um, I had a little page in front of her, but she sort of never looked at it because it was about leading by two. And I wanted to invite her to allow me to work with her and Paul Olivasados. And she said, no, no, I'm completely different. She said, my theory is two in a box. <laughs> we were like saying the same thing, you know, but like completely missing each other. And if you find, you could go to the UC Berkeley website and they are literally two in a box. She draws him inside her box. Um, so these are just some powerful examples. Um, how about this one? The younger generation will know it. On the left is Frodo, right? And Sam uh, carries him the last distance, so an interesting pair. OK, now, who is this? Warren Buffett. And so the question I have is superhero or super partner? Partner, exactly. Munger, whoever said that, right on. So Charlie Munger and um, Warren Buffett are friends since 1959. That would be 60 years, if my math is right. Is that right? Or is it 70? 60 years, yeah, the year after I was born. Uh, partners in business since 1968, 22 and 19. 41 years they've been working together. And Munger marvels at Buffett. Munger says, Warren's a lot more able than I am and very disciplined. And Buffett says about Munger, both smarter and wiser than I am. So you have this remarkable, remarkable partnership that the whole world 
other than a few smart people in a Berkeley classroom think it's all Warren Buffett, and it's just not. Um, so it's pervasive both in high places that would surprise people. Just a quick list of companies, um, Salesforce, now with a, a co-CEO um, with Benioff. Um, Whole Foods, John Mackey uh, was a co-founder with his girlfriend or wife at the time, and, uh, and frequently had a co-CEO. In the end, he was a chair with two co-CEOs, so it was kind of a, a triad before they sold out to Amazon. I'm not sure what's happening there now. Goldman Sachs is fascinating in terms of their history and went through a long period where they had uh, co-managing co partners. But not only that, they were so convinced of the power of it that they drove it down through the culture. And there were pairs at almost every high-level uh, organizational position in Goldman Sachs. So that tells you something about whatever doubts we have, and I want you to share those with me about can this be done. One of my favorites is Hewlett Packard. And the reason is because of, um, of course, they created a great company, and it was all about people. But their partnership was really extraordinary. They were, of course, in the garage in Palo Alto, you know, the classic story. Um, but uh, let me see if I remember them straight. Um, uh, Bill Hewlett was drafted into the Army in World War II, and Dave Packard cut his salary to the same level as Hewlett's during that period. And that, I mean, that to me says so much, that initiative, that sense of equity, that sense of collaboration. Um, I'm not all about make America great again, but I, I wonder if we're creating that kind of nobility of character that they demonstrated or how we do that. Um, and then as I mentioned here at UCB, of all places, two in a box. So um, on the other hand, Think of all of the places where twos are baked into things, because we know, we know that one can't do it. So in the military, you have a sergeant and lieutenant. The lieutenant's a commissioned officer, has gotten a lot of training, and is not wet behind the ears. And a sergeant's often been in battle many times. Technically, the sergeant reports to the lieutenant. But Often, the sergeant knows way more than the lieutenant does and is way more trusted a figure. Um, a governor and chief of staff, as I mentioned with my wife, I saw that up close and personal all the time and what a difference a great person made. Um, an artistic director and a business director in a theater, um, in any kind of endeavor like that, in a symphony, you know, you've got to have both wings, right, flying at the same time. An architect and engineer, nice to have the conceptual, which happens a lot of times, right, the conceptual architect, but then you've got to have somebody who can bring it down to earth. The most obvious of all, two-parent families. You know, it used to be husband and wife, now it's sometimes husband, husband, or, and oftentimes it's uh, uh, wife, ex-husband, new husband, former wife, you know, all that mechanics. But, but think about the difference when those pairs work, the power when they work, and think about the other power when they don't work, when they retreat to two heroic individuals competing over who's running the territory, what's the philosophy here, how are we going to raise these kids. Publisher, editor, producer, director, coach, general manager. One of my favorites these days was just a great story about the New York Mets pitcher Noah Syndergaard because he publicly came out. Usually that stuff stays behind. And he, he, wants to, he wants Wilson Ramos to catch him. And his statistics when Ramos is catching him are way better than the other catcher on the Mets. Uh, I've, I've got two pitchers in a class that I'm teaching with um, some students. They're actually teaching, and I'm supporting them. But we have two baseball pitchers from Cal, and they told me the catcher from last year who was drafted in the first round was incredible, and that the way they pitched was so much better because of that relationship. His knowledge, but also the emotional connection and the way he could manage them, because if you know any of those sports, the pressure when a ball is flying at enormous speed, it's the psychic stuff that makes you hold that ball too tight or hold it too long or let go of it too soon. And they talk about the way this guy managed them. Uh, you know, so who's gonna be the star, the pitcher, is the heroic leader with nobody having an understanding of the guy behind the plate and the contribution he's making. Okay, so that's prevalence, right? You see it everywhere. So the next thing I wanna talk about is power, the power of twos. And I think of it in terms of math. So it can be multiplicative. 
like you're just so much better. It's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals three. It can be additive. You know, we have different skills, different style, different experience, and that helps us. Uh, it can be subtractive, like I'm just not at my best with this person, and it can be downright divisive, right? It can be division, where it's not just the two, but whole organizations can come apart at the seams, and all kinds of stuff happens, and all kinds of turmoil that's not focused on what should be happening. So it's more powerful than leading alone, because, well, in the most up, <coughs> excuse me, obvious way, our reach is extended. You can do things I can't do. You have skills I don't have. That helps us enormously. Um, when Jennifer and I, we used to joke about having one kid, then you have two, so now you're a man-to-man -man defense, and then you have three, and it's zone defense, right? So it's like, <laughs> you're trying to shift. Who do you have? Um, so you just get reach, which is better. But I get better. When I have a great partner, I get better. One of our um, VC guys here, uh, an angel investor, talks about, Nobody can be the superstar in a startup. You have a CEO type, often a product type, uh, and then often the founder who's just passionate about everything. Um, but they each have their own roles. But when it works best, they're also teaching each other their different skills. So my wife is, she would say, a kick-ass broad. And I'm a big, tender-hearted, squishy person. So I've helped her to become more attuned to relationships, to impact to what's not said when she's on the surface and out there. And she has driven me completely, like, you got to finish, dude. You got to close. You got to move. You got to keep, hap you know, keep it happening. Um, so we've learned to elevate each other, I think. So I get better, you get better, and then we get better. The primary reason is so many business scholars, I think almost all of them, would argue that collaboration is so important, trust is so important. And when you have two people who lead at the top who can talk that talk, but people can say, yes, he walks the walk, or she walks the walk. She'll let her number two interrupt her in the middle of a meeting to say, hey, you forgot something. Right? It's not a big ego thing where the heroic leader, oh, everybody has to kowtow and bow to the heroic leader. No, you see, it's about learning. It's about learning. And so, so they become the chief learning pair, the chief learning officer, who are always making each other a little better than they were before. Um, how about this guy? Robert Reich, right? The, one of our just awesome, awesome contributors who teaches freshmen. He loves teaching freshmen in a 700-person hall. Uh, and he teaches graduate students. And he's just extraordinarily generous. And I was talking to him about this concept, just asking him, was it, one of hundreds of sit-down interviews with people, you know, tell me what it's like, how, how has it been in your life? And this is what he told me about his deputy secretary of labor, he was the secretary of labor under Bill Clinton, about his book editor, he's written 18 books, and they've all been edited by the same guy, and uh, his film producer, he's done two movies now, you may have seen Inequality for All, and I can't remember the second, something, Saving Capitalism, I think, that's, that's his book. Anyway, so this is what he said to me about Tom Glenn. By the way, I had the hardest time finding his name and finding a picture of him. So this is a typical, you know, number two story. He was the longest serving deputy, which I think says a lot about his boss, Bob Reich, that he was such a long serving deputy secretary of labor. Uh, Jonathan Siegel, his, his um, editor, and Jacob Kornbluth, who was literally the leader in the sense that Kornbluth came to Reich wasn't the other way around, and said, dude, you need to do a movie about this. You need to do like what Al Gore is doing with uh, the planet stuff. You need to do that about your uh, ideas. You need to get them out there. And Reich knew nothing about film. That's the additive part, right? You got a, you got a uh, content expert, and then you got a method expert. You have somebody who knows how to do it. And so this is what Reich said. He said, each of them has enabled me to be more than twice as effective as I could be, has complimented what I have to offer, and I hope I've done the same for them. It's more than double, it's probably triple. It's probably triple, right? It's not the heroic leader, it's the powerful relationship where you have complementary people who have different sets of skills and figure out how to build a relationship where they're constantly learning from each other. So um, I wanna share with you a little bit of the research that I've done, put you to sleep on a Saturday morning, try not to, but 
what we did was um, we talked to about 100 people and asked them, tell us about your best partnership, tell us about your worst, and we learned a lot of stuff through that. And then we took that into the field and did a pretty large scale survey where we asked people at the beginning of the survey, think about the person who's most interdependent with you now, right? The person on whom your success and their success are, are wrapped together, are tied together. And we're gonna ask a bunch of questions about that. So we were trying to get at a whole bunch of different things. We got 600 responses to this battery of questions we asked them. Um, the final question, after they'd done everything else, was all things considered, I would rate my work relationship with my colleague as, and we, we wanted to have a lot of gradations. So at one end was extremely difficult, then difficult, then you know sort of poor, average, the, the typical scale, right? At this end, at the positive deviant end, was exceptional, and then beyond that, my best ever colleague, right? So we got a real reflection of people at all scales in, in real time of where they were from extremely difficult to best ever. And so I wanna share with you a series of data points. So let me walk you through this if you're not good at it. Of course, at first blush you see a linear growth chart, right? And so in that last question we asked, tell us about uh, what's the quality of your relationship. So these are the people who, uh, for whom it was difficult or extremely difficult. This was the average, these were the high end people who said I'm in an exceptional relationship, people who said I'm in the best ever. And the title for this one, I enjoy working with my colleague, which I think is valid in and of itself. Like you spend a lot of time at work. Uh, my dad worked at Ford for 38 years in, in straight up middle white collar management. And depending on his manager, he drank more or drank less. He was happier or unhappier the seven of us got punished at the kitchen table or not. I don't mean punished, he wasn't a retributive person and he wasn't a bad drunk. He, he was alcoholic and it was worsened under bad management. And when he had managers under whom he flourished, he was a different person, right? So it affected things. It's not just happy, happy, let's all be happy at work, um, but it has real impact. You can't separate the heart from the head and you can't separate one set of people with another. You have a bad day at work, you come home, your family's in a little bit of danger. You have a bad day at home and you go to work, you're not your best self, right? So incredibly high levels of enjoyment in working with each other. And this pattern then continues across all of these questions. Energizes me to work harder and better. Uh, makes me more effective. Uh, helps our teams to work more effectively. Anybody ever been in a situation? I, I'm consulting in a situation right now where there are two groups and they have completely different stories about what's happening. And this group says these people are terrible, and this group says these people are terrible. And it starts at the top. Are they working together? And are they saying, you need to figure out how to work together, or are they saying, yes, those people are idiots over there. Yes, those people are idiots over there, right? So, so it's no surprise that people's teams are more effective and that they're better at achieving their organization's goals. These are self-reports. Right, so there's some limitation to the data. I don't have third party uh, uh, um, objective validating data, which I would love to have at some point, but that's what I have. So it's prevalent, it's powerful, and so then we stop and ask, has any of us ever been taught to be a good partner? Right, we're taught to be good speakers. We're not taught to be good listeners very much. Like, think about school, right? You've been, maybe had a public speaking class, model United Nations, there's no listening class. Uh, it just doesn't exist. So um, um, how, how do we figure out these practices? How do we deal with ego and insecurity, which is the killer, the killer to all of this stuff is ego and insecurity, not trusting. So what are the practices? Well, you tell me. First, I wanna say it's this, that there's an essential mindset of radical equality, whether I report to you or whether you report to me or whether we're peers, we're fundamentally the same. We're open about things and we're open about relationship. If you can get there, you've mastered this whole thing, right? So we can lead by two with anyone. I wanna just play this out for a minute with you, that sometimes it is horizontal, equals. I wanna come back as an identical twin because I would love to have my life be a study of, wow, how do you separate nature and nurture? 
It's the coolest thing ever. Spouses, in theory, are purely equal, right? And have to collaborate, make decisions somehow collectively, decide how you're gonna separate the territory, co-founders, co-CEOs. So we have these, <coughs> fairly rare in many respects in the professional world. And then we have this, <coughs> parent to child, or manager to direct report. And you could do whole lectures on the relationship <coughs> between those two. So we have, in this case, a, a vertical relationship. And so here I'm suggesting that manager and direct report can also lead by two, can be very powerful in that situation. And if you think about it, I think this is what leadership is about, is that you have that baby, they become a toddler, they start to move for themselves. You have that new employee. They learn where the bathroom is. They start to understand the customer. They start to have ideas of their own. And what we're always doing is shifting this axis, right? We're driving this axis down, 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 down until we're at the point where they know more than I do in lots of places, right? They have ideas and contacts I don't have. They're closer to the customer than I am. A million reasons. They have more assets than I have, though I'm still drawn in this organizational work up as being in a vertical relationship. So what I want is them to be fully empowered, my children or people who work for me, which I would say work with me, but fully empowered, self-motivating, self-directing, colleague friend, elevating each other. A lot of people still don't believe this, right? That's the big part. People don't believe this, Elev um, uh, colleague friend, right? They, there's a lot of people who still can't, can't wrap their minds around that because you might have to fire them. So we can come back to that with, in Q&A in, in a couple minutes if you want to. You know, can you be friend? And, and what is that all about? Is that dangerous territory? Should we stay away from that, run away from that? So this is the goal though, right? My 30-year-old is my best coach right now. He, he tells me more, more directly. Uh, he's learning therapy. He's getting his master's, so he's got all that. Um, um, yeah, I won't get into that anymore. So, what do you think is important? Pick four in your own mind first. Do a little mental exercise, or if you're with somebody, tell them, oh, I think I picked this and this. This is what we asked in our survey. What's gonna make a relationship great? What's gonna contribute most to a quality relationship? You got your top two or three or maybe four? Okay, so here's what the research says. Open communication, 54%. How many of you had that in your minds? Wow, look at that, amazing, amazing. Um, so we saw some patterns. One, vision and value, so it's about meaning and purpose. Where are we going? How are we gonna get there? Um, that's really important. Then we see these things that have to do with like, are we both pulling together sort of side by side? So do you have the work ethic? Do I respect your competence? And then, do you have my back, and do I have your back? So it's kind of like, you know, are we on the same page? Are we working together? I work with a lot of Jesuit schools, and they have a president and a principal. And oftentimes, where they should be shoulder to shoulder pulling the thing forward, they're like, you know, you're in my space. No, you're in my space. I want to run the parent meeting. It's, it's amazing how the ego gets in there. And then uh, a third thing, frequent and open communication. So even on that list of 15, when they'd already picked open communication, and your brain's like, well, I already wrote communication, I'm not gonna write that again. People still picked frequent communication. And really, that's the killer in relationship. When you stop talking, it's, it's, it's trouble, right? When you stop talking in marriage, in your relationship with a child, in your relationship with somebody on your team because you don't believe in them anymore, in your relationship with your boss because something has happened that's fractured it, you're going down the tubes, right? You've got to get back to talking about things. And then complementary skills is, is really important. So um, quickly on practices, I'll just share a little bit and then we can move on. So the first one, sharing vision and values. Are, are we in agreement about the strategy? Are, are we going in the same direction? And do we agree about how we treat people and how we treat the work? What's important to us? If you have that, then biodiversity is great. Then the more difference, the better. She knows a lot of people you don't know. He has experience you don't know. Um, she's really direct. You're really soft and gentle with people. 
right? She's big picture. You're in the weeds and able to execute. You know, the more of that you have, the better. Now, of course, in marriage, that can drive you crazy because she's always organized and on time, in my case, and I'm not, right? So there's natural tension there. Or um, I'm super hypersensitive to people and relationships, and my wife's doing the work, right? So there's tension there. So we have that. But if we have vision and values that orient us, then we always have that as the guiding point, not who's right, not who's in control, not who's figured everything out and who's smarter, but what do we need here? Do we need to finish or do we need to keep things open? Right, that becomes the thing, not who's right and who's in power. Um, so continually aligning these purposes so that you know, we have this teeter-totter of how we're gonna do it, that we're doing both all the time. Okay, practice two, open and frequent communication. As I pointed out, it's there all the time. This, to me, is the biggest thing and the biggest shift which women have been helping us with in the workplace for the last 50 or 60 years and has moved along is the importance of relationship and that you cannot separate the social emotional from the cognitive because they're in the same head, right? They're in the same head. So, so women tend to be, have tended to be better at relationship, at including people rather than marginalizing and being in a power relationship, and at long-term relationship, not short-term who wins, make it happen. Um, but the mastery of this side of the relationship, the emotional side, is what's critical. And frankly, you know, men, especially men in power, have lots of work to do. So for instance, when my wife was governor for eight years, every single year there was a marital, public marital breakdown. Men usually philandering was almost always the story with another man or with women, sometimes with their staffers. I mean, it was just terrible. It messed up their family. Hang on, I'm gonna get to questions in one sec. Um, messed up their family, but also it was this enormous distraction from work. So where, where was the open and frequent communication? I'm not a marriage therapist, but I think it's important. And so separating these pieces to like listen and not understand, to try to not understand, instead of I understand and you're, here's why you're wrong. <laughs> but what wisdom do you have that I don't have? Not, no, I'm older than you, I'm your mother, or not, no, I'm the boss, but help me understand why that's important. What are you seeing that I'm not seeing? Let me get ignorant so that we can be equals and I can learn. And then speaking in a way that other people can hear. Um, I teach a lot of this in my class, how to speak in I statements, how to speak in your feelings, how to uh, allow room for people to adjust and be defensive, which is our natural inbuilt wiring. Okay, practice number three, invite, you celebrate difference. Like this is the great thing about twos, we have different experience, we have different skills, different knowledge, different perspective on things, different style of accomplishing things. And that's the beauty, is how do you get that richness into the game and not see it as threatening you? Um, I have been so good, I have not mentioned our president once. <laughs> that was not easy. So I allow myself one chance before we get the preguntas to questions, which is, um, I think it's interesting that we're on a third or fourth chief of staff in three, three years, not even three years. Uh, the current one is the acting chief of staff. He's not even a real chief of staff. From all appearances, the closest relationship that would have openness of communication, shared values, is with Ivanka and, um, what's his name? Jared. Jared. Right, which is, which is such a built-in hierarchical relationship. Maybe they've shifted it, I don't know. Maybe they really speak openly and honestly and challenge each other and support each other. But it seems like what we have is a lot of support, a lot of uh, yes man, not, and, and you wonder, if, was there ever a real partnership? I mean, he's got lawyers and then, you know, they betray him and then he betrays, betrays them. That, that doesn't seem like it. His lawyers seem to like, do whatever he needs rather than be a check, which is one of the great powers of leading by two is a built-in check where your husband or wife says, honey, you wanna think about this? Or a great 
assistant to a CEO, a great chief of staff says, uh, Elon, that may not be a great idea, and <laughs> that's going to percolate through the whole place. Okay, one more quick story, and then questions. Elon Musk, in the biography I read about him, had a woman who worked for him for eight or ten years. She was his right-hand woman. Um, she was extraordinary, and she did lots of personal stuff, like get him on planes to, to see his boys, and you know he tried to be a devoted dad, from what I've read. Um, but she also was, became, as these people are, gatekeepers and evaluators. What's important, what's not? What does he need to see, what not? So she came to him and she said, um, uh, Elon, my role has changed over eight or 10 years. I still take care of your family. I still take care of your schedule. But I'm also doing a lot of pretty high level stuff and I'm not really being compensated for it. And he said, well, you have a vacation coming. You were gonna take two weeks off. Why don't you take six weeks off and we'll talk when you come back. She came back and he said, I don't need you. Um, extraordinary uh, relationship. Hardly a relationship I'm talking about of equals on some fundamental level. So on that happy note of Elon Musk, uh, preguntas. What do you think? So I have some, um, some starters. What am I missing? You know, what's wrong with my theory? What questions are begged by this? Okay, Dan, that's all good and well and good, but what about this? Or uh, what do you like and why? Shall we have a conversation? Hi. Um, <coughs> as you've Hi. talked to so many folks who are in these very powerful twos and pairs, um, what do they say about the COO eventually wanting their place in the spotlight, right? So often when a company is looking for a CEO, they're actually poaching all the amazing COOs out there. Yeah. And now you find a CEO essentially has to go replicate that relationship, build that trust, build a new find a new pair, so to speak. So how have you seen people do that when they know that eventually their significant other in the business world may want their moment in the spotlight as well? Yeah, this is a fascinating issue. So I do a lot of coaching where I onboard a top exec, a one or a two. And I've had three in the last uh, uh, two months where there was um, a CEO, two men, one woman, who left, and the COOs were all women. And in all three cases, they got passed over for a man. He was usually big, tall, in a blue suit. Um, I have two of those things going for me. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the incoming CEO was good enough to really want to share power. So when I've onboarded them, they've elevated this number two. And the number two, by the way, um, the board wanted to keep them, keep them, keep them, but didn't see them in this heroic role, right? Now, there are some things about CEO. Being strategic is really important, and there is a communicative quality, sometimes called charisma, that matters when you have shareholders, the media, et cetera. So I'm not saying the roles are exactly the same, but I'm saying these COOs were never asked to be strategic, and were not spokespeople. They labored in the dark and in the background. These women got everything done, Right? Often women, sometimes men, got everything done, but nobody asked them to grab the microphone and, and look great, right? So there's a built in you know, social unfairness, I believe, that's profound. Um, but it's also tied up in this heroic leader. Oh, he couldn't do that. She couldn't do that. Um, and I think there's a lot of narcissism, as that gentleman was saying, because the, the CEO sometimes thinks, you know, nobody could do what I do. They feel competitive sometimes with their COO. And so instead of supporting the person who supported them forever and giving them a chance, they don't. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question. You took me into one of my pet issues. <laughs> Right. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, succession planning, right? And, and having a CFO or a chief people officer or someone who's getting exposed to that COO role so that when you lose them, you know, there's, there, you're not losing as much uh, time and energy and speed as you, as you put it. Yes. Hi there. Um, Hi. My name is Cheryl, and I wanted to first thank you for talking on this subject and doing research in this area. I couldn't agree more. Uh, thank you. And, is we're talking about uh, CEOs and COs and um, people that are in the top of their profession, whether they're athletes or celebrities. Um, 
I also just, since I'm a coach um, by profession, I see the power of what you're talking about on a daily basis. Right. And what my question is, do you see the power of this supporting the emerging leaders that are coming out of Haas? In other words, as I don't know if there's some way to align them with the partnerships as they're entering into the workforce or what have you, but they have, they're coming out with a fresh perspective. They're coming yeah. out with a vault of knowledge. Right. And is there any way to use your research and your passion to help them tap into and unlock you know, their potential, which I really believe the world needs to yeah, seem out yeah. more than yeah, ever? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I don't, um, um, you should email me about that. We could talk, but um, um, it's, I, I try to equip my students to be ready, right, to be equal partners. I try to equip them that when they come in, that Shazia is going to be treated seriously and she's going to lead. She'll have a different title. She'll have to respect the one who's quote unquote above her, but she's going to lead. But oftentimes what we get and students come back to me is, Dan, this is, the world is nothing like what you're talking about. Like, I'm consulting. I'm at the client site. I'm sitting in a cubicle. I have to tell my manager I'm going to get a cup of coffee. Now, this is a young woman who's kicking ass here at Berkeley. She doesn't need anybody to watch her. Tell her what the work is, she'll get the work done, right? So that's the hard thing in this leading by two, is it really does take the number one to have the humility to elevate the relationship. So I can teach them the courage to step up, but I can't get them to generate the humility. I can teach them ways to try to communicate that won't be offensive for that ego, that will be ignorant, that will be, here's an idea that you can say is your idea, right? All that kind of crap. But it's, it's hard to, it's hard without number one saying, I'll share power. It's hard to get that. Well, yeah, and, and these young people are incredibly talented. Yeah, go ahead. And what I've seen, at least not based on the human performance research, kids, well, all of us, but especially kids new coming into the workforce are going to need internal so accountability and external because there's only so much that you can confide in people inside your organization, but they're also going to need some external support to kind of take the baton, um, this valuable information that you're instilling in them and allow them to um, apply it as they launch into the yeah. workforce. There weren't coaches 25 years ago, right? But we recognize that in that one-to-one -one learning relationship, a variant of leading by two, people grow a lot. I mean, when I was a coach 20 years ago, there were like 100 of us in Michigan. I mean, it was non-existent. I talk to a lot of students who have coaches now who've been out, you know, I've only been here 10 years. They're alumni and they have coaches now. So, and I think that's just totally great. Go ahead. So go, going down, down your list, um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it there. I think it's, it's, it's almost interesting how obvious it is once you've named it. Yeah, right, right. right. And just thinking back when, right. when Obama came into uh, his, his first term, he was, talking, he was talking about, you didn't create this out of whole cloth. You built your empire on all the things that we've all done. So it would be interesting to think about what, it's not really what you're missing, but what are the questions that are begged? And that is, maybe set the hypothesis up at looking for a counterexample. Show me a world-class leader who did it alone. And, and I think once, if anyone poses that to you, I'm pretty sure your research is gonna find, you're gonna identify that, that second person in the box. Yeah. So maybe, maybe this is a universal thing and you mm. can't get everybody to become a heroic leader that requires a second person in the box, like the person you said, I can't get these young people to do it. You can't drag people over the goal line, right. but you could show them by yeah. counterexample. There's nobody in history that we admire that did it, did it alone. So right. maybe the counterexample is the way to look at it. Right, right. It is, I, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. I think in those cases, hypothetically, I, I, my hypothesis is you won't find true partners with the strong men that are in almost every country in this globe. You will find untrusting people who ruled with fear, not with openness. So, um, so it's an interesting question. Yes, people contributed. Uh, Hitler had his gearing, but was there, was there really a, a relationship there? I, I don't think there is what I'm talking about. And one of the things that's fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's absolutely true, yeah. That, that there's always that person. The, the notion, uh, Dacher Keltner, who teaches in psych here, has a great book called Born to be Good, and he says, he says um, people got Darwin completely wrong, is what he argues persuasively in this book. It's not about survival of the fittest as the heroic person. Humanity's progress and greatness is about its ability to collaborate, not to be individual, but to collaborate and to be good. Um, but we see that with our own bosses, right? Anybody who worked, can't, can't anybody see what Trump would have been like as your own boss? And yet they'll make the leap to, you could have somebody who's that acidic, that toxic, that cruel, that blaming, as the gentleman said, blaming, every, it's always everybody else's fault. But they don't seem to see that maybe that's a problem at this highest level. It's, it's weird to me. Yes. Yeah. In the recent history, have there been examples? Here, hold it closer so people. In recent history, have yeah. there been if, uh, examples of effective partnerships in the office of the presidency? Um, you know, I think that's a really good question. So there was a woman at the University of Maryland, Georgia Sorensen, who was going to write a book about um, Hillary, about Bill Clinton and Gore, and then converted it to the triad of the three of them because they had a very special relationship. I don't know why, it was with James McGregor Burns who wrote a seminal book called Leadership in 1970. Um, the two of them were, they were writing together, co-writing. Co um, but I don't know why they didn't publish that book. But, but the suggestions are that the, those relationships were really open. Of course, Bill and Hillary are you know, a Rorschach test, right? They say more, what, what we think about Bill and Hillary says more about us probably since not many of us have met them. I've met them both, but I don't know them, right, in any significant way. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think that was a, a presidential relationship. But think about Lincoln, right? Lincoln attracted strong people, the team of rivals, as Goodwin's book was uh, titled. So he picked people he beat, who were his natural rivals, and brought them into the cabinet so that he had this richness, right? That wasn't two necessarily, but a series of two relationships where he, he was getting blowback all the time. And he was getting access to talent he didn't have, which he wanted, right? We have the exact opposite now. I know everything. I don't need anybody else. My instincts are good enough. Really? Who's, who's that person? Yes, sir. Um, Up there? Yeah, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. Yeah. One more? Or you want to, what do you do, Kenny? One more? We can do one more. And one more. We have another lecture, so. Yeah, yeah. OK, good. I think you have the microphone, sir. Oh, no, he's going to Oh, you work here. <laughs> and yeah, there's one there. Right here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I was listening to, I didn't realize you were also, I'm, I've taken Mr. Mul, uh, Professor Mulhern, excuse me, Mulhern's class. Um, I didn't realize you were Catholic. And as I listened to you talk about servant leadership, as someone who went to Catholic school, that's a big buzzword. Right. So I'm curious how, if at all, you've been able to integrate that into your teaching and your leadership consulting and how you've maybe been able to make it applicable to a secular audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Jack. I'm gonna skip this slide. I have one slide at the end, not to worry, Tenny. <laughs> so I'm gonna tie it into your question, Jack. So our greatest triumphs have come not from solo accomplishment, but they come from our ability to collaborate, to think together, Right, to really think together, not opposed to each other. Although, you know, lawyerly debate stuff can be really, really helpful, right? Sometimes it's combative to get somewhere. But being able to think together and really understand, and then really being able to love each other. So that, that becomes the essential, the unspoken, right? And all of the great partnerships I've known where people have done great work together, some of them being very analytical people, and some being very heartfelt people by nature, uh, they love each other in the end. I mean, they really care about each other, oriented toward the mission, right? It's the mission that wins. Neither of us win. I was talking to uh, the guy who did um, uh, Ordinary People, and he's, he's done the, um, the Simpsons show for 30 years. He's the producer. And I said, how do you guys write together? Like, writing is hard. I'm writing with a guy, it's hard. And he said, um, I'm not the boss. And I said, when you're the boss, how do you do it? 
And he said, um, I'm not the boss. He said, we've learned the script is the boss. Right? So we're serving this script. When I come in and coach two people at once, a CEO and a COO, I say, I don't serve the CEO. They sign my check, but I serve the mission. And all my work is going to be about the two of you orienting to the mission. And that requires, that requires a certain kind of love, <laughs> a certain kind of humility, a lot of old values that I stood for. So I hope um, just in closing, you know, I hope you just think about it, like look for twos, but also look for the ways you can contribute. Um, I thought I was called to heroic greatness, and I've lived so far a really rich life, and probably my greatest contribution in life will be having supported my wife and my um, three amazing kids, which was not in my generation what I thought I was being raised to do. Um, so this ability to serve, coming back to that, Jack, to serve another person in light of the mission is just, I think, the most enriching thing that we have in life, to serve a spouse, to serve a best friend, to serve a child, relative to the vision, right? To serve your adult children, relative to their mission, toward where they're going, and toward your shared values. I mean, that's what makes life so extraordinarily rich. So I admire your openness to thinking on a Saturday morning and to being at this great place. And uh, thanks so much for engaging with me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.